Bible says. I want you to turn with me for just a few moments to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17. You thought I didn't have, have what group ready to preach, didn't you? I've only got an hour and a half outline. We can stretch it to midnight if we need to, but for time's sake, I'll be a little brief with you tonight. Luke's Gospel, chapter number 17, beginning in verse number 1. The Lord Jesus is in conversation with his disciples. We find the very first word, then, means at that moment, at that precise time. So he begins to talk from verse 16. Uh, and and can, can I tell you, when you tie verse chapter 17, verse 1, into the close of chapter 16, where you have the parable of the, of the rich man and Lazarus, you have a true story there about hell. And in verse number uh, number uh, 17, then he said, I, it was chap, verse 27 of, of chapter 16, then he said unto me, this is the man that's in hell, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send unto him my father's house, send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, lest that he may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. And Abram said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went from, uh, unto them from the dead, we're in Luke 16, reading the last part, going to tie verse seven, chapter 17 with it. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, verse 30, but if one went from the, uh, unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, they will, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Then said he unto the disciples, It is impossible, but that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast and he cast into the sea, uh, and be cast into the sea, uh, th th that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves: if thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him; and if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, "I repent," thou shalt forgive him. And the apostles said unto the un unto the Lord, "Increase our faith." And the Lord said, if you had faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you might say unto this sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. He's in conversation with his disciples, he gives them the story of the rich man and Lazarus. You know the story, how that, in, uh, that Lazarus was laid outside the gate there of the rich man's house, and he asked an alms every day, and but the rich man died, and he was, uh, the Bible tells us that in hell he lifted up his eyes being in torment. But Lazarus also died. He was carried into the Father Abraham's bosom. He was carried to be in a place called paradise. He was carried into a place where there was bliss, there, where there was, he, there was finally rest for Lazarus. But the rich man was in turmoil. And he goes through that end and, and how that, that rich man is crying from hell and he's praying from hell. Can I tell you, there is a prayer meeting like you and I have never heard in hell tonight. For souls, for families, for friends that are lost and needing somebody. Would you send a preacher from the grave back? No, if they'll not listen to those who are alive, God said. Neither will they hear them, though they rose from the dead. And he, then he comes to chapter 17 and he says, Then, now he begins to teach them about sin and forgiveness. Can I tell you, we hinder the work of God. Why cannot they repent? Why cannot they believe the gospel? Because we have sin and unforgiveness in our lives. I mean, somebody trespasses against us and transgresses against us and we harbor an ill feeling of unforgiveness and we won't forgive them. And we become belligerent in this thing and we become uh, sinful, if you will, because that's what it is to fail to forgive when God says forgive. And he goes through this and he says, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast, and he cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. You realize somebody's soul is at stake. 
careful oh, how he begins to prick and begin to needle their heart. And he said, take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. Can I tell you, eternity, eternity's in the balance. Then he said in verse 5, And the apostles said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. Increase our faith. Can I tell you? And I believe here that the faith is not so much of an increase of faith in God. I believe they believed God. I believe they had a faith in God. But I think sometimes we need to believe one another and trust one another a little bit more when we come with a repentant heart and we ought to forgive people. We act like we're superior to God when we fail to forgive. Because at one point, you and I were upon our knees and we were crying out to a holy God, would you forgive me? How would we be tonight if God said, not hard back? Turn his back and walk away. Forgiveness. That, that sin of unforgiveness toward others hurts our faith. It weakens our faith. So they prayed and they said, Lord, increase our faith. I want you to notice that word, increase. I, I want to speak on that thought, Lord, increase our faith. But I want you to notice that word, increase. That word, increase, has a lot of emotion attached to it. How many have ever had a boss say, I'm going to increase your pay? That worked. Yeah, everyone of us has been, you know, on review, and they said, We're going to increase your pay. We're going to increase your pay 50 cents an hour. We're going to increase your pay a dollar an hour. We're going to increase you, and we're going to increase your salary 5000 a year. How would you feel? Whoopee! Uh huh. Yeah, you would. You'd get excited. But how do you feel when the government comes along and says, well, we're just going to increase your taxes? That's the other side of that increase, huh? It's like, uh, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna add two more percent to your taxes. Uh, that's my hard-earned money, not yours. In fact, if the, the, can I tell you, the people of America ought to do a federal, ought to do a federal audit on the United States government. And say you've been found guilty of malfeasance and misappropriations of funds. Filthy spending. Don't cut it. Frailty spending. Don't cut it. Foolish spending. Doesn't cut it. I have to make a little bit of outline, Mike. Are you writing this down? I'm glad they're recording this. I'll, I'll go back and get this. But uh, I, hey, you know, how do you feel when you, they're taking more money away from you? We don't like that. But here, the word increase is a word that's got a lot of emotion attached to it. And I can imagine here they've been listening to the Lord Jesus as he talks about this man in hell who lifted up his eyes. He was in torment. And that speaks of a continual torment, not a one-time uh, uh, affliction. But it's for eternity he's tormented in that flame. And he's pleading and he's crying for somebody to go back to his father's house, to his five brethren, and tell them about Christ. But yet we're harboring bitterness and, and, and sin in our heart because we won't forgive people. Boy, and they said, Lord, increase my faith. Increase my faith. I mean, I think about this, and here in our text, we find these disciples, they're perplexed at the Savior's teachings on forgiveness, and they feel, they, and they feel totally inadequate for the task given to them. How many of you feel inadequate for forgiving people? I know I do. Some people I just soon spank is to forgive. I mean, that's, that's just nature. That's my nature. I, I mean, some people, uh, and it takes work on my part. Lord, increase my faith. But I want you to notice three things about this statement as they, as they spoke to the Lord on increase our faith. I want you to notice, first of all, it was a concentrated plea. It was a concentrated plea. Consider the disciples' plea for increase is consecrated. This is the only time in the scriptures where you find the disciples imploring the Savior to act in their soul. This is the only time you find them saying, Lord, I need you to do something inside of me. 
That's beyond salvation. But I need you to do something inside of me. I mean, I need you to do a work in, in increasing the faith in me. I need... I wish I only had to go to the Lord one time for things. I have to go to Him every day to work on me, to help me. And so this... Uh, Hey, can I tell you, there's no room for pride and because the faith of God gives, that, that, that God gives us, is not our own. You realize that's His faith. When He said, when Paul said uh, in the book of Galatians, chapter 2, verse 20, He said, uh, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. It's not my faith, but it's the faith of the Son of God that God has put inside me that I live for Him day after day, and I live by faith. And I ought to, hey, it's a work. He's imparted that faith. Ricky said something about it a minute ago, about God putting that faith inside of Him to believe and to trust and to follow day by day. So this request for increase implies that there's already something that's there, a faith that is sufficient. Can I tell you, we have a faith that's sufficient for salvation. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. He's already been quoted tonight. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But can I tell you, uh, <coughs> can I tell you, uh, we're talking about a faith that uh, we have received a portion of faith. See, sa saving faith is inadequate to sustain the spiritual growth we need faith to increase that we can increase and grow spiritually for Christ and so we've all received a portion of faith look with me in Romans chapter number 12 Romans capitulo dosi I've seen little trace Romans chapter 12 verse number 3 For I say, this is Paul writing to the Christians at Rome, For I say, through the, great, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man. What's the next four words? The measure of what? Faith. The measure of faith. He's given us a measure of it or a portion of it for our health and for our growth but the expectation is that it will find root in the soul of our soul, soil of our souls and, and begin to grow. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter number 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Segundo Thessalonians is that right? Capitulo 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 1. And notice verse number 3. Paul writes and he says, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is me, because that your faith, what's that next word? Groweth how? Exceedingly. And the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. You realize as our faith grows, our love grows. As our faith grows, our giving grows. As our faith grows, our heart for souls will grow also. So the disciples' plea was not a casual request. And can I tell you tonight, if you ever pray this prayer, it cannot be a casual request of your own. It must be a consecrated plea. Lord, increase my faith. I want to grow in you. I want to grow more like you. Secondly, it's a collective plea. Notice the pronoun there. Lord, increase. Say it with me. Say it again. Our. Our. This is not my faith, but it's our faith. All of us. All of our faith. That has faith in Christ. It is a collective plea. And I want you to notice here. These men were chosen directly by the Lord. And, and they experienced His miracles. And they heard His preaching. And they, uh, but they, they knew they couldn't increase their faith on their own. They had come, in fact, in this portion here, they had come face to face with their total inadequacy to forgive like they ought to forgive. And they knew they needed God to do a work of faith in their heart and in their life. And they also realized who the source of their faith was. It was Jesus Christ. Can I tell you, our faith begins with God, and God is Jesus Christ. Therefore, 
They pled with the Savior, every one of them. I mean, it's like these four men being, being coming to the Lord together and they're on their knees together and they're praying together in unison. Lord, increase our faith. It's not just one, but it's every one of them together with a burden. Lord, increase our faith. Someone has rightly observed that we who are gathered as a church are only as strong as our weakest member. Let me ask you a question. Are you desirous for God to increase your faith? Do you have a desire for God to increase your faith? To grow you? To grow you? Are you willing to plead to God to increase faith as part of your church family? It cannot be just one or two. It must be all of us to say our faith. Our faith. Every mom, every dad, every child, son or daughter, every leader in the Sunday school, every person that sings the ground, whoever we are, Lord, increase our faith. Every person that sits in a pew, Lord, increase our faith. And keep in mind, we're not all at the same. We all have a measure of faith imparted in us. I'm reminded of the Lord Jesus Christ speaking again to his disciples in one of the Gospels. And the Lord, they'd asked the Lord for something. He said, according to your faith, be it done unto you. According to your faith, be it done unto you. Not everybody has the same level, the same measure of faith. There are some, as it was read in Romans chapter 4 there, unlike Abraham, that there are some who are weak in faith. They struggle with their faith. They struggle in believing God. They struggle in trusting Him for every need. That's why we must be strong in faith, that we can encourage them and we can shoulder their, help shoulder their burdens and bear their burdens and bring them along so they can have their faith then increased by the Lord. But notice thirdly, it was not only a consecrated plea, and a collective plea, but, but it was a consecrated, not concentrated. Concentrated first, now consecrated. It wasn't motivated by selfish desires or ambitions. See, these disciples realized that they had to be consecrated to true holiness. Look with me in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians to the school, Papa. Ephesians chapter 4, Galatians, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24. <clears throat> Versicular of Anchor Parker. If you don't mind, I'm going to back up just a little bit. Describes beginning in verse 18 what we used to be like. Verse 19. Verse 20, he said, But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation or way of life, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Look at verse 24. And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and, notice this, true holiness. Wow. They realize that they must be consecrated to true holiness. I mean, a desire not only for God to increase their faith, but something was required of them that they be true and honest, full of integrity in their walk with God and before God and before others, a life of holiness that's distinctive and set apart. See, faith is essential for every aspect of our lives. It really is for our home, for our ministries, for our jobs, for our church, for our future. Faith is essential. We cannot do what we ought to do, be what we ought to be without 
faith in our faith. Bears repeating and probably should be repeated more often than we do. But we do live in perilous times. Very perilous, troublesome times. But we also live in times of full of potential for Calvary. Never has there been an opportunity to reach so many with the gospel as quickly and as effectively as it is today. What would Paul have been able to accomplish if he had a World Wide Web for Internet access to sit before a uh, stand in, uh, before a group of people and preach and have it video recorded and then put on the internet so they go around the world. The power of the preaching of the Apostle Paul. And he turned the known world in his day upside down for God. Paul was a man on a mission with a message from the Master. And he preached it and he lived it. I mean, but today, though it may be perilous times, but yet they're full of potential. What an opportunity to be able to, to walk into the state house, to be able to walk in. And, and, you know, I always thought as a kid, you know, going down there to the state capital of Georgia on a field trip, I thought, wow, ooh, ah, when do we eat? You know, I got the ooh and ah out of the way, and then I was ready to eat. You know? But to walk in, to the Senate chamber while they were out of session and walk in and those desks were from the original state house in Milledgeville still there in the state house and touch those desks and to be feel like you're a part of history but yet behind those desks used to be men that stood for truth and righteousness and godliness in the state of Georgia. But yet, though it may be perilous today, and though there may be uh, opposition against us, what an opportunity that's before us to have an impact upon the lives of men and women and through the state capitol to let our voice be heard, to let our uh, heart be known, to let God's word be proclaimed in the chambers. You realize there's preaching every morning in the House of Representatives before they even break, break the gavel. Every morning there's 30 to 50 men and women who are in a Bible study at 7 o'clock at the state capitol from both the Senate and the House of Representatives. And they're studying the Word of God and they're praying. They want to see God turn their state back to God. They want to see a revival. They want to see our... I'm telling you, I'm excited about the potential. Here where we are, what a potential to impact and touch lives. Can I tell you... We must be persistent in our prayers. We must be faithful in prayer. And we must remember what James tells us in James chapter 4, verse 2. You have not because you ask not. And whatever we attempt to do for God, we best do it by faith. Do it by faith. Trust in God. Lord, there's eternity in, in the balance. Mom, I, I look where we're seated right here between this complex, this complex and this. Eternity and lives of people are hanging in the balance. The want of somebody to get over their petty differences and forgive one another and be like Christ and say, Lord, in preaching, you've got to work in my soul. You've got to work in my heart that I can grow and be effective for your glory. I don't know about you, but I desire God to increase my faith. I want him to work in me. I want him to change me from the inside out. We put, we put a way more emphasis on the outside in than we should. It ought to be from the inside out. I think you get the inside out and get it growing right. It won't be long. The outside takes care of itself. I'm just, I just believe that's true. What's on the inside comes out eventually, right? So let's get the inside. Lord, increase our faith that you might be glorified. Let's pray together, shall we? Every head bowed, every eye closed.